Hey everyone, Eric Hurst here, live from Old Kentucky, and coming to you on a Tuesday. You know, typically I've been doing these training cafe shows every other Monday. Yesterday I had some business to take care of at the Crag. Unfortunately, it did not get taken care of by yours truly here, but that's another story. Um, time for a couple rest days. It's quite hot here. Um, very unusual for November to be 80 degrees <laughs> at the Red River Gorge. So I'm not too psyched about the weather, but uh, nonetheless, it's a, a beautiful day and a great day to share a sip of coffee with my friends and talk training and climbing. So let's do it together. We will commune over coffee, which is what these training cafes are all about us uh, joining together in the spirit of climbing and uh, the love for training for climbing. In today's episode, the focus is your questions and I'll do my best to answer them. No specific topic uh, to cover today. And I know the last couple of episodes, I went on a little too long on the main topic and didn't get to all the questions. So I guess today, if you're here um, and didn't get your question answered last time, hopefully today is the day. So type them into the comments and I'll answer some of them as they come in. Now, one thing before we get started, the episode's shout out goes to Emily Harrington. If you haven't been on the internet lately or seen on social media, Emily did something pretty amazing. She's been working on for a couple of years. Uh, she climbed Golden Gate, a 513B route on El Cap, free in a day. Um, and there's a very small number of people that have climbed um, El Cap free for a day. And is my live stream coming through? Can someone confirm that you've been hearing me for the last uh, two minutes? Hopefully. Um, just wait for a confirmation here that my stream is working because I am in Kentucky and cell phone and internet connectivity is uh, shaky at times down here. Um, so, so in any case, hopefully you are hearing me live and uh, we are getting started with this training cafe, the focus being your questions answered. Now, I was talking about uh, the shout out for this episode to Emily Harrington, who did a uh, free in a day ascent of Golden Gate on El Capitan 513B. Um, and uh, she's not the first female to, to, to climb El Cap in a day, as some media erroneously reported, but she's the second that I know of. Uh, Lynn Hill, of course, the first in, um, what, 1994, 95, free climbing the nose of El Cap in a day. Way ahead of her time, of course. Lynn was or is amazing, um, but so is Emily Harrington, the next generation of uh, incredible free climber. And uh, so uh, the shout out to Emily. Um, and by the way, in case you didn't know, she, in addition to being a 514 sport climber and free climbing El Cap, she actually climbed Everest, Mount Everest several years ago. So that's a hat trick that probably hasn't been done by anybody else, uh, male or female you know, to sport climb 514, free climb El Cap, and do, uh, you know, and, and ascend Mount Everest to the summit. Let me know if you know of anybody else that's uh, done that three, uh, those three. Okay, um, what else do I want to talk about here before we get to your questions? Uh, type them into the comments and I'll get to them soon. Um, I am happy to announce that I'll be one of the presenters for the Performance Climbing Coach Virtual Summit, which will be held in January. Um, if uh, you are a climbing coach or, or just a weekend warrior interested in training, which is pretty much our demographic of Training Cafe, this is an event you'll want to check out. Um, there's going to be about a dozen presenters uh, being organized into uh, an online event. So that would be probably 12 hours of incredible content. And um, if you go to Performance Climbing Coach on Instagram, you can get more details on how to sign up and register for the event. I'll be speaking uh, on energy system training, and there's about a dozen other presenters speaking on a, a broad array of topics as well. So that would be a really good event to check out. 
um, and you'll be able to watch it not only live, but be able to um, view after the fact the videos for, I believe, five or six months uh, into the future so that you can come back and revisit the presentations even after the day of the event. Okay, so enough with that. Let's get on to some questions here. And interestingly enough, I mentioned energy system training, and there's uh, several questions I see typed in uh, asking about energy system training, which is a complex topic to really sort out and explain the science behind and, and then to apply it to an individual requires the nuance, um, you know, a, a personal nuance that caters to where that person's at and what their goals are and what their training history is. And, and so it's a very tough subject to summarize in a few minutes um, or let alone a 60 minute presentation, which is what I'll be doing for the, the performance climbing coach um, seminar. Um, and so answering a, a question here in a few minutes in training cafe on energy system training uh, is challenging, but let's try to do our best. And, um, the first question here is, can you explain briefly why the shotgun approach to training all energy systems at once is less effective than focusing your training on one energy system at a time? You know, what makes the adaptation poorer? Okay, well, um, there's a couple different angles I can take to answering this question, but the very first is there's some pretty good research, not with climbers, but with other athletes, that shows uh, something that scientists refer to as the interference effect. You know, it's not the training that makes you stronger or develops some capability to be greater. It's the, um, the training is the stimulus for a cascade of metabolic and chemical responses and adaptations that occur in your body. And so if you train, let's say two or all three energy systems at once in a single workout, um, there's an interference effect where you have the signal from the one type of training, let's say a lactic power, but then you have a totally different um, signal and response being triggered by your anaerobic lactic or aerobic training. Um, and so it's kind of like if you had three people shouting at you at the same time, it would be really hard for you and your ears and your brain to sort out what they're shouting at you about um, or to really be able to comprehend one of the persons uh, shouting at you. Um, and so that's kind of a crude analogy for what's happening internally with our nervous system and our body um, responding to the stimulus of a, of a given workout. Um, and so the research, if you, you know, Google around and look at some of the, the papers and it is over the past 30 years, there's been a, a number of researchers that have looked at this topic. Often it's, a, 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 um, relates to, um, runners who do weightlifting, um, or bodybuilders who do running and, you know, that kind of mixing of, uh, heavy resistance training with aerobic, you know, generalized aerobic activity. That's the easiest thing and the most obvious thing to study. Uh, in the research um, and how the two can in some ways in the short term enhance each other, but in the long term, there, there tends to be a conflict and, you know, the trainer or the athlete needs to focus on one or the other. Um, you know, you can't become a world-class power lifter living, lifting really heavy rate weights if you're doing copious amounts of generalized aerobic activity, say running 50 miles a week the effects on the body um, are different and the adaptations are markedly different. And, you know, you won't become great at either of those activities if you're doing, you know, a, a powerlifting, trying to train to be a, an elite powerlifter and trying to train to be an elite long distance runner. It doesn't work. Um, so, um, you know, that in a nutshell is a very simple explanation of the interference effect. Now, when it gets to training for climbing, yeah, we do tend to want to go to the gym um, and do a lot of different stuff. You know, you might warm up and then do some hangboard training and then do some campus training and then do some bouldering and then do some route climbing and then do some, you know, anaerobic four by four training and then maybe even try to do some volume climbing. Uh, and you pack that all into four hours. That's kind of what you uh, allude to here in your second question is, you know, 
does it make sense to kind of train in that order of a lactic, which is power, then lactic, which is power endurance, and then aerobic, which is, you know, very submaximal volume climbing that you can do for an extended period of time, 15, 30, 45 minutes. Um, and yeah, if you were going to do all of them in one session, I would do them probably in that order. But again, I don't think it's ideal. Um, and while you could do that type of thing, let's say once a week, um, I, I do think there's advantage to putting in one really grueling gym workout per week, you know, especially during the off season where you are in the gym for say four hours and you maybe run the full gamut and do that shotgun approach. Um, and maybe there's some central governor adaptations in your brain that are valuable that you get from that. But doing that as your regular three day a week training, I don't think is effective because of the interference between the energy systems. And so during the on season, you're better off um, training each energy system, say once or twice per week. Uh, and so like on a Tuesday, you could do max strength and power, which is a lactic. And then on Wednesday, you could do the anaerobic lactic system, which is, you know, those pumpy power endurance intervals and those types of exercises. Um, and then you could um, do um, aerobic climbing, submaximal climbing that gets you a little pumped, but not massively pumped. Uh, and that's a good way, kind of those threshold workouts that I often talk about. Um, that works primarily the aerobic energy system. And if you do it right, you can really build aerobic capacity that way. Um, I like to do that as a, as a separate workout on maybe the same day that I a lactic train. So on if you're on Tuesday planning a hangboard power type, you know, a lactic focused workout, if you could do the climbing specific aerobic earlier in the day, that would be ideal. Say in the morning and then do the a lactic in the afternoon or vice versa, switch them. Um, and if you have six hours in between the workouts, then there's less interference in the cascade of signals that follows the workout. Um, I've done, uh, I think four or five podcasts a few years ago. Uh, if you go into the training for climbing podcast and go back a few years, you'll find a series of very in-depth podcasts on energy system training, which really gets down into the nitty gritty details. I would encourage you to visit those if you want to learn more about applying this. But again, final word, each of us is a, a unique individual. And maybe one of your energy systems is really strong. Like if you're a boulderer and you mainly do bouldering, then you probably have a very strong alactic system already. And so you could benefit from doing a block of more anaerobic endurance, you know, lactic energy system training, or even some aerobic system training. Though that isn't a big influence on bouldering performance, it does play an underlying role in your ability to recover more quickly between boulders. Um, and so I'll leave it at that. You do need to be uh, specific on your training to not only your needs, but also your weaknesses and also just personally what, who you are, your genetics and your climbing goals. Okay. Oh, you know, here's another energy system question from Brandon. Um, so what about doing blocks, like four-week blocks that focus on one energy system? Would the other energy systems deteriorate somewhat? And yes, they they would. And that's why during, especially during the on season, I like to do that DUP, daily undulating periodization, where you train a different energy system every day. You need to take a day or two off every now and then, but you're moving from one very focused, targeted workout one day to something completely different that targets a different energy system the next day. Um, and that keeps all the energy systems up to snuff. So say if you're a weekend warrior, you arrive at the crag and everything uh, is kind of, you know, at a pretty high level so you can perform your best. Now, year round, I don't think that DUP training is the best. I think if you have an off season, there can be a benefit to doing a targeted block, especially a targeted block on an energy system that you identify as being your weakness. Maybe it's maximum strength. Maybe it's climbing specific aerobic endurance. But to do more of that individual energy system training for that block to try to elevate it, 
I think can be very helpful and can set you up for heading into the next climbing season to be a better climber physically. And by the way, if you do do a block that focuses on climbing specific aerobic development or a block that focuses on a lactic power, like campus training, I would still recommend one day a week doing a workout for the other two energy systems. So you're not abandoning them completely. So while it is a four week dedicated block on one energy system, you're still working the other two um, substantially one day a week. And so that way there's not the deterioration, Brandon, that you might expect. Um, uh, so I think that's uh, the approach that I am convinced is the best for most individuals. Um, there's a lot of other factors to take in mind. You know, for instance, if you have a, a pulley tweak, then you probably don't want to be doing any hangboard or campus training for a few weeks, you know, to kind of abandon that alactic training because it would be too stressful on your injured pulley. But to do some moderate intensity climbing specific aerobic training, like arc training, or even to do some BFR, which is more anaerobic lactic energy system, that could potentially spur on healing and keep you in pretty good shape while you uh, do have some time away from things that are stressful on that finger. Okay, let's see here, um, Gray. Okay, just finished an uh, pull-up interval workout from your book, feels amazing, just, uh, hopefully crush his 6B project. Yeah, you know, pull-up intervals, it's where you do, say, uh, five pull-ups a minute for 20 straight minutes. So you do five pull-ups, maybe that takes you 10 seconds, so then you rest the next 50 seconds, and then you do five more pull-ups and rest another 50 seconds, and you keep, on the minute, you keep doing five pull-ups. And the first few sets of five pull-ups, easy, right? Set 15, set 18, set 20, hard. Um, and so, and, and because there's a lot of rest, um, this type of training, and it's kind of like repeater training where you would do, you know, seven, three repeaters for one minute and then rest for one minute. Um, train both strength endurance, but also the aerobic energy system um, is stimulated, uh, is activated by trying to drive recovery between each bout of exercise. Um, and so these types of uh, training protocols that have limited rest between attempts, and I guess you could add boulder and four by fours to the mix where you do a boulder problem four times um, with just a brief rest in between each effort so that each effort gets harder and harder because you have limited recovery. So while you're on the wall, training mainly anaerobic lactic, you know, you're gonna get pumped if you do bouldering four by fours, you're gonna get pumped if you're doing pull-up intervals, you're gonna get some pump if you're doing repeaters. Um, you are also training the aerobic energy system. So that's an example of one type of protocol that does train two energy systems, the lactic and the aerobic system. Um, and so um, I'm not saying you have to exclusively just train one energy, energy system at a time. It's really hard to do that. Uh, but to go into the gym and do all three in one session, uh, I think is something you want to avoid. So basically, if you're doing a lot of route climbing at the gym, it's probably not a day you should be using a hangboard or a campus board other than a little bit during the warm up just to get turned on but you wouldn't want to you know combine roped climbing in the gym with a long fingerboard or campus board workout i think that type of difference um you know those things should be separated most of the time okay on to an injury question um what causes pain and stiffness and lack of mobility in the dip joints well that, my friend, is something that this guy has. Um, th this is the DIP joint, the distal joint. And especially in my case, my two middle fingers, I have some swelling and stiffness. And even, especially if I kind of like try to hyperextend it, um, have some pain in there. 
Uh, and that's not uncommon. In fact, if you show me a veteran climber or somebody who climbs avidly several days a week for years, you're going to find some pain and swelling and thickness uh, and thickening um, uh, of that DIP joint, mostly in the long fingers because they're the ones that crimp the most, especially like, you know, if you're doing a lot of open hand crimping or half crimping um, like that, uh, it's more forgiving on the pinky and index finger DIP joint, but the, the, um, the middle two fingers are being hyperflexed. In any case, for most people, it's not a serious problem. It's a chronic issue that is low grade. Um, I've had it for ever, it seems. Um, you know, there are genetic influences on joint health. Um, you know, some people have a genetic tendency towards developing arthritic um, fingers, joints as they age. Um, even without that, you can experience capsulitis um, and stiffness and, you know, some um, swelling, you know, after, a, say, a very crimpy day of climbing. Um, and there's not much you can do about it except reduce the amount of, you know, like, full crimping or half crimping that you do and favor more open crimp and open hand grips. Um, and in doing that, re reducing the, the time under tension that, that, you know, DIP joint is getting um, extended. Um, if there's a day you wake up that you're particularly sore um, or, and you want to go climbing and you feel like that might hold you back, you could take two or three ibuprofen to tamp down the, the pain a little bit. Um, however, you have to be careful you don't become a, a vitamin I addict. Uh, a lot of climbers, um, and I was one of them years ago, just basically consumed ibuprofen as if it was, you know, a, a daily vitamin um, or food, uh, because I thought that, you no know, suppressing pain and inflammation is a good thing. Um, and it's not. In fact, inflammation is one of the responses to training. Um, and I'm going to go off on a little bit of a tangent here. Um, you know, the science has really changed in the last 20 years. 20 years ago, um, you know, you would read that megadosing vitamin C antioxidant was a good thing and megadosing vitamin E and selenium um, and, you know, taking Advil every day wasn't a problem. And all these things that su suppress inflammation were viewed as being good. But to an athlete, the, the point of your training is to trigger these responses uh, that the body then recognizes um, as a need to uh, adapt to, to get stronger, to be able to prevail over these um, events, these uh, needs. Um, you know, this ide idea of hormesis, um, you know, you stress the body and it adapts um, to various stressors. Uh, and so if you're, so if you're training to cause a response in the body that you will adapt to to get stronger, but then you take ibuprofen on a daily basis, eight a day, let's say, um, or you're megadosing vitamin C because you heard it's good for you to, you know, take antioxidants in high doses, you are actually hurting your adaptations. And there's actually published research now that, um, you know, daily vitamin C consumption is not a good thing for athletes who want to adapt to training. I think in certain performance settings, let's say you're heading up on a big wall for a few days, or you're Emily Harrington heading up on, you know, to do a nose in a day, uh, or, you know, um, you're sport climbing hard three days in a row. For short bouts, taking that ibuprofen to reduce pain and inflammation isn't going to really be have a negative effect. Um, and same thing with the antioxidants. Perhaps it would be beneficial in the short term. But as a day in and day out, 365 day uh, intervention, I don't recommend those types of things, you know, because they suppress what you are seeking in terms of uh, the stimulus for adaptations. So in any case, uh, 
I kind of went off on a tangent there, but DIP, uh, pain in the joints, if it's low grade, chronic pain, welcome to being a climber who crimps a lot. Um, if it's something that escalates, of course, always see a doctor. Okay. Yes. Uh, second wave of lockdowns in some European countries. I don't know the details of it, but I have heard something about this. Um, and so Carabiner here is asking how to keep up motivation during lockdown. Um, you know, I was in a 10 week lockdown here uh, in Pennsylvania in the United States last spring, uh, uh, hardly stepped out of my house for 10 weeks. Um, certainly didn't climb any rocks outside. Um, did do a lot of training inside. And so trying to kludge together a way to do some training is helpful to do some hangboard training, not every day, um, but to do, um, you know, uh, some maybe high intensity hangs two or three days a week, and then maybe some low intensity hangs a few other days per week, uh, you know, less than body weight versus greater than body weight. And therefore, they're quite different uh, in stress and in adaptation and response. You know, coming up with ways to stay physically engaged, um, you know, core training, if you can get outside doing some going for long walks or running, um, all those things are good for your psyche. Um, you get kind of that endorphin release, um, that dopamine hit that uh, working out gives you. Um, it helps you to hopefully stay focused on moving forward. Um, and I think in terms of motivation, goals are always the, the most important thing is, okay, the lockdown won't last forever. Um, maybe it'll last a few weeks, maybe it'll last a few months, but set some goals that probably at this point you're setting, you want to think about setting goals for spring 2021 and, uh, you know, setting some specific route goals or a grade goal you want to achieve next season. Um, and then after you set the goal, then as I like to always point out, you need a system to reach the goal. And so your training and becoming ed more educated on training um, is the system, allows you to build a system to getting to your goals. Uh, you, know, you set the goals and then don't do anything and don't develop a system, then you'll never get there. Um, and so the goals are important starting point, but the system's even more important for, for pursuing the goal. Um, and so being... Um, you know, uh, future oriented in your thoughts rather than dwelling on the past or on the present, you know, the bummer of the situation is always a good place to start. Um, you know, if you're healthy and not ill with COVID and not injured, well, then that's something to be grateful for. And so, you know, waking up each day with kind of that attitude of gratitude is a, is a good way to stay positive um, and uh, hopefully motivated. And just uh, maybe through the internet, stay engaged in training um, and get involved in um, um, education, like that performance climbing coach seminar. Uh, you could sign up for in January um, and get, you know, a, a wonderful um, glut of literature to become a smarter uh, climber at Training for Climbing. And, uh, and just take it one day at a time, you know, and um, hopefully you will uh, end up a big, uh, better, stronger climber in 2021, despite the lockdown. I mean, the worst thing would be just to sit at home and watch TV um, and just give up on your training because, uh, you know, what's the point, you know, you might say, um, and you don't want to go there. Um, you know, climbers are can do people. That's what I love about our community. Um, and, and when the going gets tough, climbers, most of the ones that I know, uh, at least the ones I like to be around, when the going gets tough, the tough get going, as the saying says, you know, they know how to get it done um, in adverse situations and under pressure. And so just take this as another one of the challenges that you face on the way to reaching your climbing goals and your non-climbing goals. It's a good time to, during a lockdown, to work on other aspects of your life as well. Okay asking from a second lockdown in Germany. I'm so sad to hear that. Um, my sons and I uh, are, um, we had uh, actually hoped to go to Frankenura this this fall right now um, or back in October and that didn't happen. And so now we're looking to spring and maybe fall of 2021 until we can get to Europe. And uh, it's very, very frustrating, but I'm thankful to have access to the wonderful climbing 
we, we still have here in uh, the eastern United States. Okay. Um, hello from Greece. Hey, thanks for joining us. Uh, Neil, hey, thanks for checking in, Neil. Always good to hear from you. Um, Brian, thanks for checking in. Uh, love that we are growing our viewership here. Spread the word, please. Uh, you know, these shows are all saved to YouTube and can be viewed after the fact. Um, and so share them around. I'd really appreciate that. That'll um, keep me coming back for more, seeing the audience grow. That's always a good thing. You know, um, I've dedicated a lot of my life, you know, more than 30 years of my life to helping train climbers and provide quality information uh, that you can trust, um, research-based information, uh, and most recently products to support training uh, through my company, Fizzy Vantage. And I partner with companies like La Sportiva that have a positive uh, vision um, and really have a track record of supporting top climbers around the world and providing excellent products for the next generation of climbers, the recreational climbers out there. Um, and so whether you're an Adam Andra type or you're just getting started at climbing, uh, we're all in this together. And uh, that's what I love about family uh, businesses like La Sportiva and my own personal brand, Fizzy Vantage, though still quite small. I'm trying to grow that family feel as well. Um, if you go to fizzyvantage.com, you can subscribe to our insiders mailing list where each week I mail out not only promotional and product information, but also a training tip most weeks. And so that's uh, one way to get more information and learn specifically about nutritional interventions to support your training and your climbing. Um, okay, Wyatt, you know, we've got uh, quite a few people here. I don't recognize names from before. So uh, thank you so much for tuning in. Another question here. Um, Okay, board training like moon boarding and kilter, and here in the United States we have the tension board uh, uh, as well, um, and uh, the new grasshopper board, um, Boone Speeds Company out of Salt Lake City. Check out grasshopperclimbing.com uh, to learn about their uh, system wall that is adjustable. A um, lot of great stuff happening on that front. Um, and the ability to share problems, uh, develop a database through a, an app on your phone is uh, really uh, revolutionary um, to climbing, allowing people in different parts of the world to do the same boulder problems, essentially, um, um, that uh, have been logged into the uh, apps. Um, in terms of introduction to board training, Start easy and um, take more of a volume approach as you um, get into board training. Um, I, I, what I've observed uh, is that these, these system boards are addictive. Um, it's fun to be able to go in and test yourself every single workout um, and see what's the hardest boulder I can do every single workout and to be able to check some boxes and you know tick off some routes. Um, and the problem is if every time you get on the board, let's say you're doing, um, you know, moon board or kilter or tension board three days per week. If every session becomes a limit bouldering session, then you're not training most effectively. Um, it would be like, imagine if you're an Olympic sprinter and, you know, like the 100 meter dash or the, you know, 1600 meter, whatever, middle distance. If every workout was doing the 100 meter dash or for the 1600 meter runner, if every workout they went out and tried to run the 1600 meter as hard as they could, it wouldn't work. Nobody trains that way, but yet a lot of climbers train that way. Um, and so, yeah, if you're, if you're only a boulderer, obviously you're going to do a lot of bouldering and you're not going to have much reason to get on a rope, but it still doesn't mean that every bouldering session should be a limit bouldering session where you are going all out. Um, there would be advantages to having sessions where you're doing a bunch of routes below your limit with um, limited rest, let's say. You know, when you're limit bouldering, you tend to try, a, you know, one problem every three to five minutes. So you have 
extensive, nearly complete recovery between attempts. And that's great if you're alactic training. But if you want to train the anaerobic lactic system, then you want to make your rests shorter. Um, and so that's where the bouldering four by fours, or you could do four by four training on a uh, board, um, you know, setup as well. That's more of a lactic workout with some aerobic adaptation as well. Or you could just do a day where you do, um, now you can't hog up the board, but if you went and did a bunch of really easy problems, you know, instead of going to the gym and on the, 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 the um, limit day where you might try to do 10 problems within, you know, two grades of your limit, you know, your limits V10. So you're going to do 10 problems V8, V9 to V10. You would rest a lot between those. It would be very alactic, you know, very max strength, max power kind of workout. The other side of the coin would be if you did a slew of problems. Again, this is if you're a V10 climber. If you did a slew of problems that were V4 and below, which might seem boring and might not look all that impressive, but it would be if you did, you know, um, 40 problems V4 and under, it would give you a markedly different workout and signal some different adaptations that you haven't gotten before. Um, and again, uh, I think there'd be more value uh, if you are a board climber to not just do every workout that same limit workout, maybe twice a week, but maybe the other two days you do some other things or maybe not get on the board, maybe get on a rope and do some other things um, so that you can uh, benefit from training up the other uh, energy systems. I, I'm not sure if I did a good job answering your question there, but I sure hope so. Okay, thank you, by the way, for the heads up that everything is loud and clear. Um, sent first route, first uh, 11A. Felt incredibly, incredibly pumped. How do I build endurance and prevent the pump? Okay, well, common, common question, especially at a place like the Red River Gorge, because every time you fail, or even most of the times you get to the anchors, you are really, really pumped. And so that leads you down the path of thinking, I just need to have stronger forearms or more endurance in the forearms. Um, but it's, and it might, uh, the snap conclusion that many climbers make is that, well, I need to do more of these things that get me pumped to adapt in a way to help me get less pumped in the future, climbing 11A or whatever, you know, grade gets you really, really pumped. But to do so would mean that all of your training or the bulk of your training would be that anaerobic lactic energy system. And here's something interesting, getting back to the energy system topic. That energy system is the least trainable of the three energy systems. I would go so far as to say for a very experienced, you know, veteran climber, like an Adamandra, or maybe even myself, you know, who climbs and trains a lot, um, that anaerobic lactic system doesn't get much stronger year over year. It doesn't change. It is a finite anaerobic reserve. You could think of it as a, you know, a gas tank that is fixed in size. Um, and that reserve, when it gets tapped out, that's when your form's fail you and get pumped out. That anaerobic lactic energy system has run aground, has the reserve is emptied. It's self-destructed. You know, all of those terms kind of apply to what happens when you deplete that anaerobic lactic system. And that's the feeling you have in your form. So while there are specific adaptations relating to lactate transporters and buffering that occur to maximize your reserve, if you're climbing a couple of days a week and getting pumped, you have those adaptations. Um, if you just hangboard train for a month or moonboard train for a month or just route climb some maximally for a month, then you lose some of those adaptations, those lactic specific adaptations. And so a, a, a few sessions will bring them back up to snuff and maximize your anaerobic reserve. But the long-term answer to getting pumped less on routes of a certain grade so that you can climb harder is to get stronger 
that's anaerobic lactic system, or I'm sorry, anaerobic alactic system. So doing maximum strength fingerboard protocol training, increasing your strength level, and improve your aerobic power, the strength, the rate at which the aerobic energy system, mitochondria, can generate ATP. And by strengthening those two energy systems, you reduce the need or you, you um, tap less extensively the anaerobic reserve and it lasts longer on any given route. Or when you rest on a route and you're pumped, the aerobic energy system is uh, consuming lactate and helping you recover, um, helping that lactic system recover. And so your anaerobic reserve might be depleted as you're pumped out on a mid-climb rest. But if you can shake out for five minutes or even stand or sit for 10 or 15 minutes, if you have a strong aerobic energy system during that rest, it is driving recovery and refilling your anaerobic reserve. If you watch the video of Adam Andra on silence, that's why those knee bars were so crucial for him to be able to hang out for a minute or two or three to let the aerobic system recharge his anaerobic reserve so he could power through the next 30 or 40 seconds of pumpy you know, power endurance climbing. And so all three energy systems dovetail and in some way influence each other. That's why it's a tricky topic to talk about. And for a lot of climbers and even for a lot of coaches, it's a tough subject to sort out and completely understand. Because what you would intuitively think, in your case, I arrived at the anchors with pumped forearms. How do I get less pumped forearms in the same situation? You might say, just do more of the same thing and get pumped. And that's actually the least effective way in the long term to um, resolve that situation. You want to get stronger. you know. So make it your winter mission, getting specifically back to uh, this question. Make your winter mission to develop more finger strength and at the same time, do enough climbing volume, say two days a week, to preserve your aerobic energy system and maybe even make it stronger during the winter climbing season. Um, and then you will head into next season with new capabilities in those areas that reduces the, the draw, the rate of you know, that you're tapping into that anaerobic lactic energy system. And you will realize that you will get less pumped on climbing that 511A. Um, and so it sounds counterintuitive, but training the other two energy systems is the pathway to getting less pumped. You can't just do pumpy climbing four days a week and expect to get better. In fact, many climbers try that and what they get is injured or overtrained and eventually actually diminishing results because the chronic acidosis three, four, five days a week of doing that type of lactic training actually has an adverse effect on mitochondria and actually weakens your aerobic energy system. If you talk to elite runners, elite rowers, um, you know, athletes that uh, are kind of power endurance athletes, they are very careful uh, to limit the volume of lactic training because of the adverse effects it has on the aerobic energy system. Um, they, a lot of like uh, people that are milers, let's say, will limit their lactic training. You know, their actual running the mile, the 1600 meter is very lactic. And that's why they do that so rarely. The, the event that they wanna go to the Olympics on, running 1600 meters all out, they do very rarely maybe five to 10% of their training, because if they do too much of it, it'll become them, they'll be overtrained and actually get diminishing results. And so they'll do more time doing shorter sprint intervals and also some volume, you know, to build their base. Um, so I could go on and on about this energy system stuff. It's fascinating, but to really unravel it is challenging. And a lot of people that just learn a little bit about the topic tend to not get the nuance right, unfortunately. Okay, we're at about 45 minutes here. Um, so it's soon time to wrap things up. Um, I guess I've tapped out, uh, maybe, have I tapped out of all the questions here? Let me just see. 
Um, well, a few more I see that popped in. I'm sorry. Um, and I'm getting long-winded, so actually I've fallen behind here a little bit. <laughs> um, yes, question about getting uh, fizzy managed products in the, in the UK or in EU countries. I'm working on it. With COVID, it's impossible to try to set up a deal. And I have a couple different pathways to get the products there. Uh, right now, you can only get them through our website, and it's very expensive, I, I'm sorry to say, to ship across the ocean and it takes a few weeks so it's not ideal but i'm hoping once covid plays out we'll get things resolved and you'll uh, all the followers of uh, training for climbing and uh, training cafe will be able to experience the fizzy advantage um, so that's something i am working on okay okay so um yeah i i am someone who really um, is an advocate of DUP uh, programs, again, mainly during the on season, um, but it, it could also have its place in the off season, depending on your situation. What about the elbow prehab um, and uh, even finger prehab and all those uh, other often overlooked, but important types of training, you know, antagonist training, you know, rotator cuff training, core training. Um, yeah, I, I prefer doing that stuff on a separate day. I mean, core, I often uh, will have um, clients and I recommend doing at the end of a climbing workout if you have the time. Um, some of the prehab stuff you could build into your warm up if you have a 30 minute warm up like I do when I'm training at the gym. Um, it's a really long progressive warm up that includes some rotator cuff type uh, exercises. Um, uh, a lot of low load things. Uh, but then if you want to do specific training, like, you know, density hangs, you know, long duration isometrics, um, same thing um, that help um, tendon health. Uh, you know, uh, if you have an injury rehab, I, I think doing separate sessions is ideal. You could do maybe a lot of that stuff at home in the morning and then do your main climbing workout in the afternoon uh, or on rest days. Uh, you know, as long as it doesn't turn into a a hard climbing workout, then you kind of waste your rest days. But um, that's where being a planner, you know, planning things out a week at a time, knowing where you're going to schedule in your different workouts, where you're going to have your rest. Um, and especially if there's going to be some performance climbing in that week, you want to make sure that you have enough recovery time before your performance climb so that you're um, fully recovered. So, um, so I, I'm a big fan of doing two a day training. If you're a well conditioned athlete, um, if you're a pro climber, then you almost certainly have to be doing two a day training to really do everything you need to do to get the volume in that you need to do uh, and not have that interference effect that we talked about earlier, um, kind of negating your efforts. You, you need to be doing two sessions a day and separating them. Uh, and so um, pro climbers like my son, Cameron, um, when he's in a training block, when he's not traveling, um, for a month, let's say, it's pretty much, you know, four days of training, two a days. So that's eight workouts. Um, and then maybe two days where there's some running and some generalized training, and then, you know, at least one full rest day per week. Um, but that's a lot of training. Uh, it's not for the typical weekend warrior. Um, but if you're a highly trained um, climber of many years, then it's what it might take to train more effectively and take your climbing to the next level. Yeah, this is a, a, a tough one. Um, you know, if you're a route setter or forerunner, how do you combine that with your training? Th that's, that's a challenge, you know, setters, uh, that's a tough job and an important job. Um, and so if you're on the wall, hanging around in a harness, <laughs> uh, and you know, if you're forerunning and getting pumped working routes, you know, the routes are dictating your workout, not you, you know, designing a workout that's optimal for you. So that's really challenging. Um, and there are some pro climbers who have done it well. John Cardwell for many years, a setter out in Boulder, Colorado, you know, and really hard climber, you know, climbs, you know, I'm not sure if he's done 15A, probably has. Um, you know, climbs at a very high level for many years and has been a route setter. And so it, it can be done. I also hear from a lot of people that do both that get injured, unfortunately, because it's just like, it's hard to avoid loading your fingers extensively and intensively 
um, six or seven days a week, which is not ideal. I mean, you can load your fingers lightly seven days per week, but in terms of intense training and hard climbing, and if you're forerunning at your limit, that's high intensity loading. And if you're doing that more than about four days per week, you're likely to fall behind um, in terms of connective tissue recovery. And that's where some people will eventually succumb to injury. Um, and so I don't have any great advice to give you, I'm sorry to say, other than try to plan your weeks out smartly. If you know what days you're forerunning, um, you know, can you make that a training day where if you're going to you know, forerun in the afternoon, could you do a strength power workout six hours before that or eight hours before that? And there's kind of your two a day. Um, rather than doing the forerunning and getting highly fatigued uh, the one afternoon and then the next day doing your strength and power. And then when, when do you ever get a rest day? When do your tendons ever get a rest day? Um, so maybe try to double up if you can. Um, but again, that might be a heck of a lot of loading on a single day, depending how long you are forerunning. So um, I, I, I'm sorry, I don't have a great answer to give you there, except try to be a compulsive planner and place value on having a few rest days per week, if at all possible. Um, yeah, well, how long of a gap between um, workouts to avoid interference? Well, six hours. Uh, you know, there's, there's some research to support that if you can get them separated by six or more hours, there's less interference. And, uh, you know, so that would be ideal. Um, or 24 hours where you do, you know, max strength one day and then anaerobic uh, lactic the next day really depends on who you are. Again, your training experience, you know, an elite climber could probably do strength and power in the morning and uh, power endurance in the afternoon with six or eight hours in between. Whereas maybe a more novice or intermediate climber would want to have them separated by a full day. Yeah. Uh, Tricam number six here says uh, return from a month of climbing uh, in Utah canyons and lost weight, got weak best approach to regain his strength. And that's not uncommon. I mean, I, when I, you know, I'm on a climbing trip now for a few weeks. And when I get home and test myself, I, I will undoubtedly be weaker when it comes to training max grip strength. So when you go on trips, uh, you tend to lose your high end strength and power a little bit each week. Um, especially when you get beyond, uh, two, three, four weeks, it, it really trails off if you're not doing any training if you're just performance climbing or route climbing, um, your endurance can stay up high or even grow, um, you know, over the course of several weeks of, of, a, of a climbing trip. But, that, you know, there's a reason you know, a lot of the pros, you know, um, I've mentioned a number of times about, you know, someone like an Alex Megos will go on a trip somewhere for three weeks and then fly home and do a training block. Um, you know, to stay on the trip for six weeks doesn't make much sense because you've lost the, the max strength and power you need to climb at your highest level. Um, and so, uh, you know, uh, you know the, the good news is you return home and do even just, a, you know, two or three hangboard training sessions, campus board training sessions, complex training sessions, you get your max strength. You're, you're right back up there. Happens fast, you know, one to two weeks for most people that you get back to that upper level. So that's the progression season and year over year is you're going to make these advances and then you're going to backtrack at times due to trips, due to breaks from climbing or whatnot, take two weeks off during the holidays, whatever. Um, but then you get back to where you were, uh, you get back to your high point more quickly. Um, and so long term, if you're disciplined at training and well structured in your training over months and years, it's an upward climb. And uh, the adaptations can continue to play out for many years into your 30s, perhaps even 40s. You get to be my age, then, you know, Mother Nature is working against you in terms of, you know, testosterone levels dropping and collagen resynthesis slowing. And there's a number of things that, um, you know, that start to fade that you need to really train and eat smartly to avoid. Um, but I imagine most of you uh, listening are much younger than me and, um, that's not a concern. So yeah, you'll get you'll get your max strength back pretty quick. Just uh, just put a two week block of you know max strength training, and you'll be right back there. Um, 
confused where the seven three repeaters fit in to fingerboard training. Um, yeah, you know, seven three repeaters um, are a strength endurance exercise. So they, um, you know, if you're doing six seven three repeaters, so that's a minute, and then you rest a minute, and then you do another set of seven three repeaters, and you keep going like that for ten or 15 sets, maybe changing the grip position each time. That's a strength endurance workout that mimics doing a hard sport climb, you know, climbing a long sport climb where you, you know, do some moves for a minute, then you get to a bucket and shake out and then do some moves. And so that's a strength endurance workout that trains the anaerobic lactic system and also during the recovery periods, the aerobic energy system. So it's a very effective training strategy for route climbers. Now, um, and so you would want to have those kind of in that energy system and those energy system blocks or days that you're training. Now, if you do seven through repeaters with weight on, you know, um, where you just do one set, you know, one minute, and then maybe you're resting for three to five minutes, then that is, um, it's still strength endurance, but it's more towards the lactic end of the spectrum. It's more lactic and a lot, um, a lactic and lactic uh, versus if you're doing many sets with just brief one minute rest in between, that is more lactic aerobic. Um, and so uh, there is a difference there. And so I think you have to, um, if you're doing the seven through repeaters with just the one minute rest between sets, you're at, at maybe less than body weight or you're on a fairly you know moderate or even larger hold so that you don't reach failure. You don't want to ever reach failure when you're doing those many sets of repeaters. Your goal is to avoid failure, essentially. Manage the pump, just like being, say, on a route. Um, but if you're doing weighted seven through repeaters where you just do one set and then rest for five minutes, then that's more, it's alactic, intellactic, um, and it is uh, much less aerobic. Uh, and so that's a different strategy and probably less effective, I think, when it comes to repeater training. So with repeater training, air perhaps on the side of a little less resistance or slightly larger holds so that you don't fail. Okay. Okay, from Brazil, uh, his city doesn't have a climbing gym. Yeah, you know, um, training forums three days a week. I mean, uh, you know, uh, having a hangboard, building a small home, woody, if you can, a little overhanging wall to do some bouldering on, those would be ideal because they're climbing specific. Um, in terms of normal gym exercises, like that a weightlifter would do, um, you can do some generalized training, but you wouldn't want to be doing a bodybuilding workout. Uh, you wouldn't want to be doing many sets of bicep curls because, you know, you think about bicep curls, that's not a movement you really do in climbing. You know, you do grab underclings that are more isometric in nature. Um, and so there is, it's not bad to do a little bit of that type of training, but to just go in and do a bodybuilder's workout at a weightlifting gym of bench press and squat and barbell curls, that's not effective training for climbing. It's good generalized training, but it's also going to probably bulk you up over time. And that's not ideal for climbing. Um, you know, a climber needs to maximize strength to weight ratio. So you want to get stronger without getting heavier. Um, and so, uh, um, and if anything, if you have unwanted body weight, body fat, unnecessary muscle, you even want to reduce that a little bit so that you're getting stronger and reducing weight. And that really multiplies strength to weight ratio. Um, so, you know, doing some aerobic activity like running, doing some yoga and flexibility work, you know, those are all things you can do that don't require a climbing gym. And they're not game changers for, for training for climbing, you know, because you need to be specific in your training to really make a huge difference. Um, and so um, any type of activity, I guess, is better than nothing but the more climbing specific, the better.
Okay, Eric here says he does five seconds on, five seconds off. I guess that is um, a different type of repeater workout. Um, yeah, um, you know, he's talking about coupling uh, supercharged collagen with finger loading. And that is um, the protocol that I've promoted for a couple of years now. And there's good evidence basis for the idea of if you consume vitamin C enriched hydrolyzed collagen peptides that are easily digested and quickly spikes uh, the collagen specific amino acids, glycine, proline, and hydroxyproline into your bloodstream, um, and then load your fingers 30 to 60 minutes later, the loading uh, of connective tissues is how they get nourishment, not from blood flow like muscles do. Uh, and so whereas muscles need protein after the workout, connective tissues benefit mostly from protein consumed before a workout. And the best protein for connective tissues is something like supercharged collagen. In fact, I, there's no other product designed specifically for the purpose um, as this. Uh, you know, the, the generic collagens out there, um, I won't say they're garbage, but they're not ideal for a number of reasons I won't get into. Um, they lack, they're not complete proteins and they, um, the, the quality is questionable. And, um, you know, if they're not vitamin C enriched, um, and ours is leucine enriched. I mean, there's a lot of technology built into supercharged collagen to amplify the benefits of a finger rehab or um, any type of tendon training workout, doing density hangs, long duration isometrics, those types of exercises. Um, you can all perhaps double the collagen synthesis and the benefit of the workout by consuming this supercharged collagen before you do the loading. Uh, and you can read more about that uh, technology and even some of the research behind it at physivantage.com. So yes, what you describe, Eric, sounds perfect to me. Yeah, that's a, a good su uh, suggestion there um, during lockdowns is to commune with other like-minded people and push each other via Skype or Zoom uh, and to, you know, um, have that dialogue. That is a good way. It's, you know, it's, it's more motivating and more fun to train with other people. And if you're in lockdown, you really can't do that unless you do it virtually. And I guess we're kind of doing that right here. I hope, hope that's one of the things that training cafe does is to help uh, get you pumped up and informed and inspired. Um, question here about capsulitis in the toes. Um, I don't have any specific experience. Uh, you know, I am lucky to have pretty healthy toes, but some climbers have really gnarly toes. Um, and uh, everybody's different, I guess, in what type of shoes you shove your feet into. Um, La Sportiva shoes, which is what I've worn exclusively for 30 years, might as well have been built for my foot. They're perfectly shaped, the last for my foot. And so um, I'm blessed to have shoes that fit me so well that I don't have toe problems. Uh, and so, um, you know, I don't have any experience. Again, if the problem is getting worse or is preventing you from climbing, see a doctor. Maybe you need to change shoes. You know, maybe you need to find a shoe that fits better. Try a different company. Um, I'm always an advocate of saying, you know, there's a lot of great shoes out there. I mean, I'm a big believer in La Sportiva, obviously, um, but you have to find a shoe that fits your foot first and foremost. Um, and so you, you might want to experiment with some different shoes and different companies to see if you can find something that maybe will resolve your problem in the long run. <clears throat> yeah, bouldering volume, that's a tricky subject, you know, because, um, you know, bouldering is a strength power activity. And so by uh, definition, it's more about intensity than volume, whereas rock climbing is more about volume than intensity. But yet, if you're going bouldering, um, you know, if you would follow a climber like a Matt Foltz around, um, they do a lot of volume uh, of bouldering, which is necessity at their level. You know, if you're bouldering V16, you know, that's part of his training to improve year over year is to not only get stronger and more powerful, but to develop the ability to climb more hard routes in a day. Um, or and rope climbing, same thing. The number of routes that Andra or Megos do in a day is unbelievable. Um, uh, I was with Alex at the New River Gorge uh, a few years ago, um, and in the matter of a day, you know, he warmed up on 
13 C and then um, did a 14 B first ascent and then did a second ascent of a 14 B and then did another 14 A. He was just popping off these hard routes one after another. And so that came through years of training and increasing the amount of volume he could do of max strength and of hard routes. And also for Alex, uh, you know, 14 B is well below his limit. So he's not even working that hard. So, um, and, or Matt Foltz, if he's doing a bunch of E10s in a day, well, that's not that hard for him for his level. But um, so you do need to, to build volume, but the other side of the coin is not get injured in the process. And that's how many climbing injuries come about is too much high intensity climbing. Uh, when you add the volume in, it should be submaximal, not at your limit. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, so, you know, when you are doing a session, whether it's outdoors or indoors, you know, after your warm up, build up into doing some of your limit routes, but then pull back and add the volume in submaximally. Um, and I think that's a more effective way to do it. If you're just beating yourself against the wall or against the boulder, trying to do 30 goes on this near limit route, that often ends up an injury, uh, if not today, tomorrow, or the next day. Um, and so you have to know when to say when and um, let go of the route and come back to it another day stronger with better skin better conditions and, and maybe, you know, a little stronger from training. Um, some routes you just can't beat to submission, right? Um, biggest difference between a 12A and a 13A climber. I would say climbing efficiency. Um, you know, uh, these days people get to 12A, that's 7A plus pretty fast. Um, if you're young and active, you know, in your 20s or 30s or maybe 40s and you get into climbing and climb a few days a week at the gym and get outside and experience different rock types, you, people get to 12A fast. Some people in a year, some people in three years, some people in five years, but, um, you know, th they get there fast. Uh, to get to 13A, well, yeah, it does take stronger fingers. It does take more endurance, but more than anything, it takes more climbing expertise, more uh, nuanced, uh, movement, um, reducing all those energy leaks that we have. A lot of them are mental, emotional, um, in nature, over gripping, getting scared of falling. Um, and you burn through that anaerobic reserve quickly and pump out, um, learning to climb more efficiently, learning to climb faster. I would say the average 513 climber, if you compared them on video to a 512 climber, you would see the 513A climber is faster um, and therefore more efficient. And if you did a really a motion analysis, you would see that they're they're doing more nuance with hip turning and uh, and things like that. They're getting on and off small holds more quickly. Uh, you know, a lot of 12A climbers they get to a hard, a difficult hold or you know a hard move, and they slow down. And they think about it. Well, am I strong enough for this move? Um, can I hold on to this crimp? The 13A climber, because they're more experienced, knows that when they hit a small hold, get off of it quickly. Move on quickly. Don't think about how small the hold is. Get to the next better hold. Um, and so it's a strategy thing. Um, and so I think, um, yeah, if you finger tested the 13A versus the 12A climber, you might find the 13A climber does have a bit stronger fingers, but maybe not. You would definitely discover if you analyze them that they're a more efficient climber, a more emotionally controlled and relaxed climber. Um, and they, when they get to hard climbing, climb faster um, through those near limit moves, through those crux moves, rather than slowing down, which is what maybe a, a lesser climber would do. Um, again, everybody's different, so it's hard to give concrete answers, but that's kind of my <clears throat> gut feeling there. Um, let's see here. Noah. Yeah. So you drive all right. Um, Bob Marley, that's a crag here at the red. So that's cool. Um, that we have somebody here at the red enjoying the pretty warm weather here. Um, a beautiful day. I'm not going to complain, but it's not ideal for climbing at your limit. That is for sure. Um, Andy, first timer here. Thanks for joining us. Um, Neil, um, is listening while training. That's awesome to hear. Um, I will send you my bill at the end of the session here for um, 
the uh, narration of your workout. Uh, okay, let's see here. Pain in the wrist while, not while grabbing holds, but right after falling off. I'll tell you, wrists are, wrists are a complicated joint. Wrists and shoulders are, are pesky joints for climbers to figure out what's going on. And I, I don't have much to tell you here about the wrist. Uh, there can be a lot of different things going on there. Um, I would, whatever causes the pain, I would reduce that, you know, do that less or not at all. If you can't escape the pain um, after you let go or jump off the wall, that worries me. Um, and certainly if it gets worse, as always, see a doctor um, uh, or PT uh, and get, you know, a diagnosis or get, uh, find out if there's some rehab you can do. But I, I can't I can't diagnose a wrist over uh, the Internet here. I'm sorry to say that's a, um, a uh, you know, kind of like a shoulder injury. Very, you know, you need a expert diagnosis you know, clinical examination and perhaps some imagery to get to the bottom of uh, certain wrist and shoulder injuries. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah, you know, very training um, is important. You know, we as climbers tend to, I love training. I've always loved training. And I guess that makes sense. I host something called the Training Cafe where we commune with coffee, but um, uh, uh, we tend to fall in love with our workouts. You know, people fall in love with their tension board, their moon board. Uh, they fall in love with, you know, um, ticking off routes um, on the moon board or on going to the gym on the climbing wall. We tend to fall into habits, ways of doing things. I really like doing weighted hangs. Um, I, I love it and tracking how much weight I can hold and whether I can get some progress or not. And I've been doing that for years. And you know what I've discovered the last few years is that um, when I come back from a trip, I would start doing some weighted hangs because I enjoy doing them and I feel like they benefit me. And I would find they do benefit me for two or three weeks. And I would do maybe two weighted hang sessions a week for, say, three weeks. And I would get strong session over session over session. But because I take detailed notes, I also discover that by week four, week five, I don't get any gains. And by you know week five or week six, I'm actually getting weaker. So that little block of you know three or four weeks is all I need to get back to my max strength. And if I keep doing the exact same workout, I start getting negative results. Well, that's kind of the definition of insanity of training doing the same thing, expecting to get, um, you know, go one way when the evidence is you're going the other way. Um, and so that is why some type of periodization is important and some type of um, training variation is important. You can't just go to the gym and do the same thing week in and week out and expect to progress. Now, you might progress because you're climbing and getting becoming a more efficient climber, but are you physiologically progressing? You know, your different energy systems, are they getting stronger? And that's where a coach who does some testing, or if you do some testing with a lattice board system or something similar, um, you can track your results and see what you're getting out of your training. It might not be what you think you're getting. And so I have to, uh, when I return from a trip, I'll do my three or four week block of weighted hangs, but then I start to shift things around adjust my workouts um, and do something different for a while. You know, maybe do more repeater type training instead of the max hang workouts. Uh, and so, yeah, being more proactive and not just being a creature of habit is important. Um, Yuri says, you are on fire today. Well, that's good. I hope um, this material is connecting with most of you. And I'm coming up in an hour or actually I'm way over an hour. Holy smokes. A record long training cafe, folks. Shall we toast to that? It's a rest day. What? I'm not in a hurry, right? Uh, <laughs> um, okay, let's just fire through the last few here real quick here. Um, yeah, you know, when it gets to your core and antagonist training, you don't need to be periodized as much. Um, and that is kind of where 
um, I think with core training, the big mistake is just doing one or two exercises, you know, doing some crunches or some rollouts and saying that's it, or doing some planks and saying, well, that's enough. And your core, you know, think of it as your whole, you know, shoulders to hips, anterior, posterior, you need to hit it with different exercises and different angles. So you, I, I think a good core workout should have three or four different exercises done uh, together to make for a good core workout, but you don't need to like cycle them or periodize them. And same thing with the antagonist training, um, you know, in the rotator cuff training, you're not doing bodybuilder workouts for these body parts. You're developing strength endurance is what you're really after. You know, you need to have the rotator cuff and scapular stabilizers endure and be able to maintain proper climbing posture as you're doing a long route or you're doing a pumpy boulder problem. Um, and so you should think of those as being strength endurance types of workouts, um, not using the heaviest weights possible, but down a step or two from that uh, and doing more, um, you know, 10 to 20 rep sets that are, you know, proven to be more strength endurance type exercises. And if you're doing rehab of an injury, well, then you certainly want to follow the specific protocols that a, a PT would be giving you. Um, and maybe incorporating things like BFR and such, um, but I won't go any further there. Yeah, that sounds good. You know, the prehab stuff, you know, um, to avoid injury, to strengthen your connective tissues, um, you know, to load the climbing tendons with the collagen consumed ahead of time, to do the density hangs with the collagen consumed ahead of time. Um, doing those things two days per week separate from your climbing workout, I think would be ideal. And that, my friend, is being proactive in trying to develop stronger connective tissues and hopefully dodge or at least reduce the injury risk when you do your max strength, max climbing days. Yeah, you know, um, crack climbing is a very specific skill set. And so um, while I'm not going to say that fingerboard training, um, hangboard repeaters are a waste of time, they obviously are not very specific to how you grab the rock in crack climbing. You know what is specific to that is crack climbing. And so, you know, the more often you can get on cracks, you know, some climbing gyms have artificial cracks so you can climb. Some people build little crack simulators at home using, you know, lumber. Um, that is way more effective than hangboard training. Um, uh, that's not my area of expertise, nor something I've coached a lot. So I, I hate to, um, you know, steer you the wrong direction, maybe tell you the wrong thing. Um, you might reach out to someone like uh, Tom Randall with Lattice, who is an experienced crack climber and coach of crack climbing. I would ping him and see what advice he has and what grips might cross over um, and be more beneficial for a crack climber to reach your goals. Okay. I'm not sure what that's in reference to. I'm sorry to say, um, I, um, have uh, gone through so many questions. I don't remember what the, the previous question was to be able to give you a good follow-up on that. Um, That sounds pretty good. You know, that sounds like a strength endurance protocol uh, for a um, perhaps a route climber th that uh, could be pretty effective. Um, combined with, you know, um, again, you have to be careful. You know, you just can't stack too many things into one workout. Um, you know, again, if you did max weight hangs on a hangboard uh, and then later in the session did repeaters um, and then later in the session did campus training man, you're just all over the place there with that stimulus, you know, um, and that is uh, not being focused in terms of energy system training. Uh, that's more of that shotgun approach uh, that we talked about wanting to avoid. Um, and so separating some of those out into separate workouts would be uh, more effective. Yeah, I, I don't have a product to recommend. I mean, you'd want to look for a hydrolyzed collagen peptide. That is the ideal for getting it into your bloodstream most quickly. Um, vitamin C enrichment is a plus because the research has shown that to be beneficial. And we have a, a few other things that we've done to supercharge collagen to make it truly a one-of-a-kind product 
and I think the most effective, but a high quality hydrolyzed collagen peptide um, with vitamin C would be um, something you could substitute in if you can find that in Europe. There are a lot of junk collagen products out there, and I don't say that flippantly. I mean, just collagen brought in by the boatload from China. You don't know what it came from, what animal, what testing it's had. You know, does it have heavy metals? I mean, who the heck knows? Whereas uh, everything that um, Fizzy Vantage generates is a premium grade. It's tested coming into the factory and going out of the factory. Um, and, you know, I when I launched a nutrition brand, decided from the get go that, you know, if I'm connecting my name to this and my my um, brand that I've built over 40 years as a climber, I'm going to do things top shelf, top of the line that um, I can sleep at night knowing I'm selling the best product. to climb this Wi-Fi here. It looks like maybe it blinked out for a little bit. Hopefully there haven't been too many te technology um, problems here on Wi-Fi in Kentucky, but it seems like we're still going strong here and we're an hour and 20 minutes into this um, training cafe. Um, greetings from Mexico. Appreciate that. Um, yeah, you know, a new podcast was, was uh, released last Monday, uh, Training for Climbing podcast. Subscribe to that on iTunes or your favorite pod player. Um, thoughts on hypertrophy training over the winter? Well, you got to be careful. A lot of people talk about hypertrophy training because they view that growing a larger muscle is essential for becoming stronger, achieving the next level of strength. And I would counter that and say, if you look at photos of the top climbers, whether it's, you know, Adam Andra or Alex Megos or Matt Foltz or, um, you know, Drew Anna or, you know, name a top, you know, Stefan, uh, Stefano, Stolfi, uh, Jakob Schubert, Yanya, their bodies aren't changing much year over year. I bet their body weight doesn't fluctuate more than a kilo year round. Um, they are getting stronger and maintaining the same body weight, maybe in season, actually lowering their body weight slightly, you know, healthfully. You can't starve yourself to the higher grades, but you can't put on tons of weight and get to the higher grades either. So if you're talking about a little bit of hypertrophy in the climbing muscles, slight growth, okay, I'm okay with that. But if you're talking about packing on muscle, you know, five pounds, two, three kilos during a winter training block, you're doing the wrong training, my friend. Um, and so hypertrophy training is really in quotes. You might do things that in a textbook would be considered hypertrophy training, like repeaters uh, might be considered hypertrophy. Weighted repeaters might be considered an exercise that would fit into that class of hypertrophy training. But are you really getting bigger? I don't know. You know, maybe your forearm circumference goes up slightly, but that's really genetically dictated, you know, the shape of your muscles and how much you respond to training with hypertrophy is very much genetically dictated. And um, again, the climbers like Megos are getting stronger season over season because of neurological changes and connective tissue changes. If you develop a stiffer, tendon, stiffer extracellular matrix, you transmit force more uh, efficiently um, and realize more strength and power in your grip. And you haven't built a bigger, stronger muscle. You've, you've fine tuned the connective tissues. And that's the beauty of uh, tendon training and sinew training, as I call it, that I've written a lot about. And you can find a lot of articles on trainingforclimbing.com and physivantage.com. If you read up on that topic, listen to the podcasts I've done on sinew training, um, you will discover a key to unlocking more strength and power without putting on weight, without hypertrophy. And that is what an athlete is after in a strength to ratio sport. And I guess that's a good place for me to wrap up this podcast, uh, podcast, boy, um, live stream training cafe. Um, I hope you really enjoyed this record length episode. Please share the link around, the YouTube link around after the fact with your friends. 
Um, I appreciate all the positive comments and feedback, and uh, we're going to continue to do these um, every other Monday, uh, this being a special Tuesday edition. But two weeks from now, I'll try to get it back on Monday so you can kind of set it in your schedule and join me each week. So with that, Eric Hurst signing off. Until next time, train smart, climb strong.